Good evening, everyone. I'm Stephen Bartkus, the curator of the Gun Historical Museum here in Washington, Connecticut. Thank you for joining us for the first of our two very interesting lectures about the Chippewa River, the story of a river contrasting history of the Chippewa. The river's natural beauty and force have been attracting people to Washington for thousands of years up to our present time. Tonight, our distinguished guest, Edwin Matthews, will be illuminating the river's early history for us. Gene Solomon, a trustee of the Gun Memorial Library and Museum, will be introducing him. During this lecture, we ask that you please mute both your audio and video settings. If you have any questions, you may submit them through the chat box during the lecture, and Edwin will answer some of them at the end. Please note that the second lecture of our series, The Story of a River, Rallies to Save the Chippewag, will take place on Monday, August 3rd at 6.30. Please register for that lecture on the Gun Museum's website. Now I'd like to hand it over to Jean. Hello and good evening. My name is Jean Solomon. It is my great pleasure to welcome our guest lecturer, Edwin Matthews president of the Chapag River Association. For the past 30 years, Edwin has been active in the defense of the Chapag River and was responsible, along with others, for the litigation that resulted in an agreement to limit diversions of water from the river by Waterbury. He was a founder of Friends of the Earth International, a worldwide environmental organization now in 75 countries. For many years, he has served as a trustee of the Steep Rock Association and Earth Justice, a not-for-profit law firm for the environment. Edwin lives on a farm here in Washington, Connecticut. He is a committed environmentalist, an accomplished attorney, an author, and my friend. He has also published a book of essays on wildness around us, entitled Litchfield Country Journal. Thank you, Edwin, for your participation this evening. Now I'll hand this over to you. Thank you, Jean. Thank you for your kind introduction. Um, as you know, I'm happy to talk about the Chapag River and could perhaps do that for hours, although today, we will only, I will only talk for an hour. What, what after all is the Chapag? This river is much more than a mere water course. For 15,000 years, the Chapag River has obstinately wound its way toward the far distant sea. It had a violent birth under the ice. For thousands of years, it sustained Native Americans on its shores. Its tumbling water powered our first industry and fed agriculture for our early communities. The river gave its gave path to the Chapag Railroad that carried our products south and brought people to the valley. Sometimes the Chapag has swollen and raged wild and carried us away. But now the river is mostly our gentle, ever-rolling stream, faithfully and quietly with its flows, giving life to our valley. It is the heart of a complex system of life. Every day we see this river and we hear its mu the music of its waters and it is part of us. The Chapag has named our schools and our community gatherings. Each year on Memorial Day, the river receives our modest offering of wreath to our fallen soldiers. On September 5, 1838, Henry David Thoreau wrote something in his journal. Quote, for the first time, it occurred to me this afternoon, what a piece of wonder a river is. A huge volume of matter ceaselessly rolling through the fields and meadows, 
of this substantial earth, making haste from the high places by stable dwellings of men and Egyptian pyramids to its restless reservoir." Unquote. Today you will find these words etched on the footbridge which crosses the Chapag in Steep Rock's Hidden Valley. The bridge is named for Thoreau. Now as rivers go, the Chapag is not very old, but it has many stories. It was born only about 20,000 years ago under the ice that then covered much of Connecticut. Before that, the Pleistocene era lasted for millions of years. A massive continental ice sheet had pushed from the north into Connecticut and covered its landscape. The ice dug deep canyons and flattened the drumlins that now make up our friendly Berkshire landscape. Walk in our words to, woods today and you will find telltale scratches on large rocks. These are called striations, scratches left by the moving glaciers that reveal their presence and that give us a measure of history. You will also see what geologists call erratics, large out of place boulders that the ice must have carried for miles and left just anywhere, stranded as the ice melted. Huge runoffs from the melting ice must have produced a cataclysmic scene for the river. Huge flooding, river flows, moved the newly exposed broken earth. For much of its life, our tranquil stream must have been a raging torrent as it rushed from its high places towards the sea. It was only about 10,000 years ago that after the ice had melted, that the river settled down to resemble the tranquil stream we know today. As the earth's climate warmed and the continental ice retreated, Forests quickly colonize the landscape. First, the tundra grasses and conifers, including white pines we know today. Then deciduous trees took root that make up the mixed hardwood forests that persist in our time. The receding ice also opened up the continent to colonization by many small animals we know today but also large animals, including mastodons and giant beavers and ground sloths. They all moved north, living on the plant and animal life that invaded Connecticut from the south as the ice retreated. These early animals were followed closely by a predator, the first humans, descendants of those who about 18,000 years ago or earlier had crossed the land bridge to North America from Asia. Due to water captured in the land ice, the oceans were then hundreds of feet lower than they are today. It took only a few thousand years for these first human immigrants probably to go down the ice-free Western North America and cross the continent to reach what is now Connecticut. The first humans in the Chapag Valley are called the first people or the original people. Their descendants became the tribes we later identified as the Wianatanaks and the Sajatoks and others. Now, archaeological research has made some extraordinary discoveries. Remarkably, the earliest documented presence in Connecticut is right in documented human presence in Connecticut is right 
in Washington along the Chippewa River. Based on radiocarbon dating, charred wood associated with this campsite has been determined to be 10,300 years old. The camp in the Chippewa appears to have been continuously occupied, occupied by Native Americans for about 4,000 years until 1500 AD. No evidence has been found of their use as a campsite after that date. Many of the 7,400 artifacts collected from the Chippewa site are preserved in Washington's Institute for American Indian Studies. For example, spear points have been recovered that were fashioned out of a sharp flaking stone called shirt, which is not known to occur in outcops in Connecticut, but that the natives probably found in erratic boulders on the shores of the Chippewa nearby. These boulders must have been carried by the ice and the powerful river from outcrops north as far as Massachusetts and Vermont, where chert does occur. Although they used the camp in the Chippewa, along the Chippewa for thousands of years, these First people occupied the, Japan, the camp only in warming mo warmer months, as their homeland, homeland stretched far south to the sea. The Washington Institute has built a current reconstruction of their native dwellings. The first people survived off of wild nature, the mega funny, the funny that they hunted to extinction and also smaller game and river fish and all kinds of nourishing berries, roots, leaves, blossoms, roots, nuts, and seeds that occur in the Chippewa River ecosystem that they prepared with a whole variety of natural flavorings. They knew how to live off the Chippewa's bounty and proved by their survival over thousands of years how it is possible to be sustained by the natural world. Native Americans had diverse cultures and languages, but they built no durable civilization, left no lasting structures, no large body of writings. When the colonists first settled the Chippewa River Valley in the 1600s, the first people had already disappeared largely, but they gave us many names including the name of the Chippewa itself, which meant Rocky River. As now, the Chippewa must have been navigable only during the spring freshets. And today we are left mainly with our own images of their beautiful existence that we have reconstructed from their oral tradition and discarded artifacts. Now, when Columbus discovered America in 1492, there was no part of Connecticut, indeed no part of North America, that was not claimed by Native American tribes. There were estimated then to be 12 to 15 million Native Americans in over 300 Native nations in North America. By 1980, there were only about 237,000 living. What happened to the first people? Their numbers had always been limited by constraints of their harsh existence, famine, tribal conflict, accidents, and severe weather. But it was Europeans everywhere who occupied and chased natives from the immense wild habitat on which they depended for survival. Europeans also brought disease, especially the smallpox virus that proved fatal to natives. It's in just the past six months, we have acquired our own appreciation of how dangerous a virus can spread to large numbers of vulnerable humans. 
Europeans established stable communities. We brought with us an indomitable civilization with settled habits. We planted crops, kept sedentary animals, built immovable houses and villages and multiple places of worship and learning and roads everywhere. Our presence was incompatible with the first people who depended on sparsely populated large wildness for their existence. Europeans preempted the wild space Native Americans needed to survive. Even though fragments of land were ultimately allocated to Native terror tribes that survived in Connecticut, there was no longer wild space sufficient to sustain the traditional lifestyle of even those few who remained. Might we pause for a moment from our hectic lives to reflect on the long occupation of our river valley by the first people. For nearly 10,000 years, they survived in the Chapag Valley. All the while, pyramids were built and abandoned, and Rome was built and destroyed, and even great human civilizations like the Mayan were born and forgotten. Colonists first came to the Chapag River Valley only about 400 years ago. In that brief time, we have established ourselves and built our own communities. We believe we will surely last, but have we little experience beyond this brief period? How can we claim to stay for as long as the first Americans? But with impressive energy and determination, colonists in our valley built their communities, clearing the forests and planting subsistence farms. New England's inexhaustible supply of stones left by the glaciers were removed one by one, hand by hand, and planted in walls that still lace the landscape everywhere. If you visited the river valley 200 years ago, you would have seen few trees as the Chapag was a source of water and precious power, mills and forges were installed on its shores. The waste polluted the river. Minerals were discovered. Quartz, iron, and lead mines and, and quarries were opened near the river. By the 19th century, Washington Depot then known as Factory Hollow, had box factories, sawmills, cigar factories, creameries, and bars and churches, and brothels, and a growing immigrant population from Sweden, Denmark, or between Sweden, Germany, and Ireland principally. In the 1870s, a steam railroad was built up the river from Roxbury to Litchfield as it followed the ever crooked Chabog, it was said to be the crookedest railroad in America. If you were to hike along the Chabog in 1900, you would have found no paths particularly, but clear cuts, waste from the mills and smoke and frequent fires from steam engines and burning timber for charcoal and piles of discarded waste. There was no longer any game, no deer, no wild turkeys. The Chapag was not then a pristine river, but it had become a resource for the generation of labor and, and industry and wealth. In its natural state, the river would have had low flows during much of the summer when it did not rain. But when it did rain, its wet water carried away our industrial human race. But in the latter 19th century, the vocation of the Chapag Valley slowly changed. As New York City grew, those who could afford to leave its steamy air fled to the country and the natural beauty of the Chapag. Wealthy families came to the valley and built extravagant houses on the higher ground of Washington Green, safely above or high above Factory Hollow. Country schools were established 
there, and holiday houses for city, city dwellers were constructed. In 1893, the holiday house was built to provide 75 working women from the city with a country experience at any time. It was donated by a New York merchant in the garment district who had lost his daughter to diphtheria. The Holiday House even had its own suspension bridge designed by Roebling that spanned the Chapag from the Holiday House Railroad Station to allow visitors to reach the house on the opposite hillside. After its donor died, the house was demolished in 1923. Parts were recycled in other buildings all over town. Now the newcomers did not come to farm or build factories. They came as willing refugees from the city to enjoy the climate and natural beauty of the valley. The natural beauty of the Chopag had survived industry and farming and became the principal trade of the valley. Those who came to live in the valley came because it was a place they desired to be. And they began to care for the preservation of the land. Some like Eric Rossiter invested their savings to save land from the clear cuts. And in his case, this was the beginning of the Steep Lock Land Trust. By our time, over a hundred years later, Steep Rock has preserved thousands of acres along the Chapag and has stepped forward to defend the river itself. From its past as a river to exploit, the Chapag was becoming for us a river to preserve. It also happened in the 20th century that the farms and industrial developments of the valley failed. The railroad that opened along the river in 1872 was probably never profitable and was abandoned after the last train ran on June 11, 1948. In the 19th century, the Erie Canal had opened Eastern markets to competition from Western farms. The Civil War and two war world wars had taken men from the farms, many never to return. Many valley farms could no longer sustain those who remained. It's worth remembering that 22 men from this Washington alone were killed in the Civil War. Without the railroad, fresh milk from dairy farms in Washington could no longer get to the city. The Chapag River was now to be valued for its beauty and interest as a natural stream and for human recreation. But new threats for the, to the river would soon arise. In the 19th century, the prosperous foundries in Wa Waterbury were selling brass to the world. And Waterbury was a, <coughs> was a wealthy city. But foundries, the foundries overtaxed Waterbury's supply of water from the Naugatuck River, just a few low mountains east of the Chapal. One morning in the 1910s, the elders of Washington awoke to learn that the city of Waterbury had purchased 28 miles of land that encompassed the entire headwaters of the Chapag River. Waterbury announced its plan to dam the Chapag and divert river water to Waterbury. Faced with losing their river, citizens lobbied the legislature to pass the law to prevent taking water from the Chapag but this initiative failed. Facing de defeat, in 1921, the town of Washington er entered into a contract with the, Washington wa with the Waterbury Water Bureau to protect the river flows. The co this contract purported to limit taking water from the Chapag when the reservoirs on the Naugatuck side were full and overflowing and required releases to the river, uh, to the Chapag River 
of a minimum of, of a million and a half gallons per day. But these restrictions would prove to be insufficient to protect the river. One and a half million gallons a day is not much water for a river. And without oversight, Waterbury easily avoided the limitations of the contract. Washington town elders cannot be faulted for not understanding the hydrology of the river, however. We were only able to understand the river flows and Waterbury's operations many years later with the help of computers and expert hydrologists. By 1934, Waterbury had dug a seven mile tunnel under the from the Chapag under Bantam Lake to the Naugatuck Rail watershed. And Waterbury had built a dam on the Chapag upstream of Route 202 in Woodville. The project was reported by the Bridgeport newspaper as quote, the most difficult project ever undertaken by a municipality in Connecticut. Serious when we consider the effect on many miles of streams below the diversion. The Bridgeport paper also expressed its prophetic regret that cities extend so many tentacles into the countryside to seize all streams all over Connecticut leaving dried up brooks that represent only a fraction of their former volume. In, in the 1950s, Waterbury added a second, much larger dam and reservoir on the Chabog, upstream from the first, and began taking increased amounts of water from the Chabog. Indeed, we later learned that by the 1980s, Waterbury was taking most of its water from the Chapag and not even using its own reservoir system. Because of these diversions, the river was almost dry in summer months. Life in the river disappeared. People in the valley could not help but notice and were increasingly angry as they suffered with their beloved river without water. Over the ensuing 50 years, troubled citizens repeatedly questioned Waterbury's diversions, but with little effect. Various commissions and study groups were established and held countless meetings, but there was no progress. Waterbury obstinately refused to discuss the operation of its reservoirs or any limit of its diversions from the river. In, in August 1955, a calamity occurred. Mother Nature struck the Sepang. Following weeks of excessive rainfall, in two days, multiple hurricanes dumped nearly two feet of rain on the Sepang watershed. The river was overflowing. Large debris, including whole trees, fell in the river and plugged the culvert under Route 202 upstream in Woodville that impounded a large lake behind 202 upstream from Washington Depot. The highway, of course, was not designed to be a dam. And on Saturday morning, August 19, 1955, the highway suddenly gave way. A 20-foot wall of water roared down the Chapag, inundating Washington Depot. Not since the Ice Age had the Chapag seen a flood like 1955. Substantial buildings close to the river were swept away. Bill and Maude Folloyt lived in one. They refused to be rescued as their house disappeared down the raging river, leaving only its naked abutments, they perished. The Floyd's house is on the left before the flood, and on the right is what was left the day after the flood. The whole center of Washington Depot was destroyed, 
and it had to be rebuilt over years. But the town survived and flourishes today. In 1968, there was a chance for federal protection of the Chippewa River. Concern for the America's wild rivers, such as the Chippewa, led the US Congress to pass a statute to declare that free flowing rivers with remarkable scenic, historical, and natural values should be protected. 144 rivers in America were selected for study. To support the Chippewa case, Connecticut's Senator Ribicoff descended the Chippewa in a canoe with spectacles. The National Park Service recommended that 28 miles of the Chippewa should be protected. But because local citizens would not yield control of their river, federal protections for the Chippewa were spurned. However, river communities were also unable to implement any effective local restrictions on water berries diversions. They were left to rely on the 1921 contract that was proving inadequate to maintain the river. I came to Washington around 1990. I still remember my first walk to the Chippewa. What was wrong with this river, I asked. There was no water. As a lawyer, I had worked on wilderness protection and volunteered to assist. So I had volunteered to assist others concerned. But I found meetings of concerned residents endless and without result. There was a genuine worry about the river, but citizens were powerless. There seemed to be no way to bring water Barry to discuss Good, in good faith, the protection of the river. I remember one snowy winter day when I began to realize what we were up against. I attended a meeting at the Waterbury Water Bureau. As I was new to the room, I was not recognized. And when others were absent, Lenny Assart, the superintendent of the Water Bureau, loudly exclaimed, quote, there is no way they are going to get more water for their fucking river, unquote. As we believed that the Chapag was everybody's river to save and protect, I was surprised that Waterbury, the Waterbury Water Bureau appeared not to care even a fig for the river. What else was driving the, the Bureau, I wondered. Had the precious Chapag come to be an innocent object of an internecine quarrel between Northwest Connecticut towns. It was later that I realized that our arguments with Waterbury were not really about the Chapag. Only after some years did I appreciate that Waterbury's resistance came from human beings, from their need for power and their resentment at the well being of towns in the bucolic. Chapag Valley. Waterbury was now struggling financially. The dispute over the river would prove not even to be about water, because as we would later discover, there was plenty of water for both Waterbury and the river. With Waterbury's continuing and transitive in the mid 1980s, sorry, George Ward, who was the president of Steep Rock, decided on an ambitious new tact. Without asking, and he never asked, he formed a new group. He called the Chapag River Association to begin to get, bring together all river stakeholders in Washington and Roxbury. Steep Rock, the, Wash, the Roxbury Land Trust, the first selectman of the two towns. And this was his way of getting things done. And I ended up, along with many others, being responsible for defending the ancient Sapong. But if today we owe saving the river to anyone, 
it is to this indefatigable and blessedly determined retired corporate executive who initiated and inspired our campaign to save the river. George Ward died before we even went to court. And we sang America the Beautiful at his memorial. There were of course many others too numerous to mention who made substantial contributions to saving the river, but none as important as George Ward. Under the banner of the unified group, Further attempts to negotiate with Waterbury were pursued with energy, but they continued to fail. The governor set up a task force that after many meetings yielded a report, but nothing cracked, nothing concrete. We even asked the then Attorney General Blumenthal to mediate. However, Waterbury refused his intervention. By 1997, it became clear, as it should have been years before, we had to go to court to force Waterbury to limit its diversions. We decided to sue. On successive town meetings in Washington and Roxbury, hundreds voted to approve what was an ambitious and expensive lawsuit defying all precedent for votes of town meetings in Connecticut. It was approved by both towns unanimously. Everyone just loved their river. The very next day, we learned that Waterbury, seeking some tactical advantage, had sued us first. We filed anyway, and the two cases were consolidated with irony, the defenders of the river became the defendants in the suit, and Waterbury, the accused, the plaintiff. On July 27, 1997, the New York Times reported that Washington and Roxbury have gone to battle stations in a long simmering dispute with their larger neighbor, Waterbury over rights to water from the Chapag River. The battle for the river was now joined. In a second talk, I will explain how we proved the river's case, and finally, after years, reached an agreement to protect the Chapag. As we know, history does not just happen. History is what we make of what happens. The the story of the Chapag River is, therefore, not just about the river, but about us. The stories of the river explain our human story. The Chapag River has many contrasting stories, a few fragments of which I have chosen to talk about today. Its violent and improbable recent birth under the ice how so quickly life, first plants, then animals and human beings came to share its welcoming shores. And the impressive stay in our valley of those first humans who prospered here for thousands of years until their tragic passing before the first Europeans. How our predecessors bravely colonized the Chapag River Valley using the river for their industry and agriculture to build their new communities. Then, how those colonists fell in love with the Chapag and began to protect the river. How the 1955 flood briefly asserted nature's ultimate control. And finally, in our time, how we began to fight to save the river from those who were taking its water. This last chapter of the Chapag story will be the subject of the second museum talk on August 3rd, for which I hope you will be able to attend. I thank you for your patience and wish to thank especially the museum's curator, Stephen Barkas and Jean Solomon for assembling the illustrations for this talk. I would be delighted to answer your questions. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you very much, Edwin, for sharing the amazing history of the Chapaug River with us this evening. If anyone has any questions for Edwin, please type them into the chat box below and uh, we'll select a few for him to uh, answer. I'd like to start off with, um, you know, what is the quality of the Chapaug River's water today? Is it polluted at all? Well, the water that comes off over the lower Chapaug Dam, not surprisingly, is excellent. It is drinking water quality, and that's why Waterbury was interested in it and takes the water. Uh, when the Chapaug River meets the Bantam River, which comes from Litchfield, after about three miles, the quality of the water deteriorates a notch and the river becomes a river you should not be drinking, but which you can swim in. That deterioration is because of Litchfield's sewage treatment plant that empties into the Bantam River. In the future, um, our descendants will have the pleasure of negotiating with Litchfield a replacement of their plant in order to avoid the pollution of the river. And, um, you know, where does the Chapaug River come from? Do you know, um, or could you tell us what the head source of the river is and uh, where it terminates today? Well, the head of the river in the, in the Waterbury owned watershed was from multiple streams, many of which have been inundated by Waterbury's upper dam um, on the river. However, um, the river today is born in Warren and in small streams and ends as it falls over the Roxbury Falls into Lake Lilanoa after about 50 miles. It's an amazing trip for a river and in a canoe, it's, it's an amazing trip in the spring. Sure, and uh, we have a question from Diane and she's asking, are the tributaries monitored for water quality? I, I assume that Litchfield does something to monitor the Bantam. Um, and I also assume that Waterbury monitors the quality of the water going into its reservoirs. They're very careful with that. Um, beyond that, I don't know of any other monitoring. Some of the streams to the Chapag, like Bee Brook or Walker Brook, have been looked at. And there has been concern, I know, about pollution in those streams, largely agricultural runoff. When we were growing corn in Meeker Swamp, the pesticides and herbicides required for growing corn did end up in Bee Brook and ended up in the Chapag. Let's stop now. Um, I don't know of a systematic monitoring, but there have been lots of people who have looked at the river and concerned, been concerned about its the water quality. It is an Actually, even though its water is deteriorates some because of the Bantam River, it's an extraordinary resource water-wise, not quantity-wise, but quality-wise. We have a question from Thomas. Uh, he's asking uh, exactly where is the dam? And uh, I believe there's a couple dams, right? Do you want to talk about that um, on the Chapag River? Yeah, it's, it's hard to know where these dams are because Waterbury won't let you into their land. Um, and indeed, if you go in and are caught, you'll be arrested for trespassing. That is, um, but the lower Chapag Dam, which was built in the 30s, 
is three miles um, about north of the confluence with the Bantam, which probably makes it about a mile and a half north of Route 202. The, the larger dam with the larger reservoir above that is a couple miles higher. So those two dams, which you can see on a topographical map or on Google Earth, are very hard to visit. Um, I, um, but there are two dams. Now on the, Waterbury has a reservoir system I will explain in the next lecture on the Naugatuck side with dams that impound three reservoirs. But there are only two dams on the Chapag. Um, in addition to those, there of course remains a dam in Roxbury, which is simply a um, stone abutment over which the river flows. Um, to meet, which requires that in the event you canoe to Roxbury, you must be careful to remove the canoe and yourself from the river before you get to the Roxbury Dam. <laughs> and uh, if you stay, if you got over the dam, you then have a lovely paddle for several, maybe a mile or so until you would go over Roxbury Falls, which are absolutely impassable. And that would be the end of your canoe and you. Thank you. Um, a related question, Michael asks, was the seven mile tunnel actually used for water diversion? And is it still used today? Yes, indeed. It's about, it's about five feet high and three or four feet wide. And it has a sort of rounded, um, a floor and smooth walls and no lining um, particularly. And the water from the lower Chapag Dam, Waterbury Dam, is diverted into that tunnel and flows underneath Bantam Lake to the higher water bar, where a water reservoir on the Naugatuck side. It's been used since 1932 and except for repairs and um, when it's had to been shut down uh, briefly, it's continued to operate since. And at one point, most of the Chapag River that we adore went through that tunnel and not down the Chapag channel. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, how is the river used for recreation today? And this ties into Lorraine's question. Where and what are the best fishing spots on the river? Oh, the fishing spot, that's very confidential information that I could hardly honestly share with all of you on this call. Um, I think, but the river, the Chapag River is, is stocked by the Washington Fish and Game Club, Rod and Gun Club, and it's been, um, there's been um, reasonably good fishing at obviously various points along the river. There's no one hole that I know I could share um, with all of you without risking, of course, having a hundred people show up tomorrow morning um, at that place. Um, but um, it's a lovely river to fish. There are not a great many fish. I mean, it's coming back and there are enough fish to support the um, river since we have reached the agreement and the flows in the Chapag have been restored or become more even. Um, there is evidence that the fish and creatures that live on the fish have come back. The fish depend on um, 
insects. Insects depend on the water, as do the fish. And um, several couple years ago, I ran into three river otters on the banks of the Chapaug and Hidden Valley. Those river otters are a, a happy evidence of the res restoration of the river. They were playing on the bank. They slide in the bank and in the mud and play in the water, but they depend on fish. The fact that three river otters can live in Hidden Valley is a very happy event. Thank you. Um, Michelle is wondering if you can comment on the water in Lake Lilanola and Lake Zor. Um, I, I can't, but all I do know is that Lake Lilanoa, I don't know much about the water quality, except it does mainly come from the Housatonic. The Housatonic is a river upstream at Pittsfield, was terribly polluted by General Electric in years, years ago, and has led to billions of dollars of damages and um, a whole a whole restoration plan for the Housatonic that is in process and much debated. Um, in manufacturing um, isolators and insulators for electrical equipment, General Electric dumped PCBs in the river. Those are dangerous. And there is a large debate um, over whether it's better just to leave them or uh, which is not satisfactory or if they should be removed which means the river has to be dredged and the soil removed and processed which is also obviously terribly destructive. That pollution is has polluted and still does along with other sources the Housatonic, which is the main source of water for the for Lake Lilanoa. Um, I think that the water that comes from the Chapaug River into Lake Lilanoa um, probably somewhat improves the quality of Lake Lilanoa. Um, you know, and the other thing I know about Lake Lilanoa is that it's it it suffers from invasive um, species which um, are very difficult to eradicate if ever allowed to gain ground. Um, so we, we are blessed today with a Chapag River that is extraordinarily pristine. Given its history, given what it's been through, um, much of that because of us. Uh, we're extremely lucky that it's there and that we have it and that it will be perturbed for the future. But its preservation depends on vigilance, on people, not just people loving and using it, but people paying attention to what's happening. And as John Lewis has pointed out, um, getting into trouble from time to time for the sake of the river. Thank you. Um, Thomas, Thomas yes. asks, will the Chapaug, uh, excuse me, will the Steep Rock Association open the gate to allow further access? I can't speak for Steep Rock. I don't know what gate he's talking about. Mm -hmm. There are, um, there, the only gates I know are gates that protect uh, the preserve from automobile traffic. Um, I doubt that those will be removed except as necessary to maintain the preserve. The preserve does not allow motorized vehicles. And fortunately, it does because without that, we would not have a preserve. I don't know what a great gate is um, talked about, but those those gates, if, if whomever asked that question would like to ask, um, inquire at the, 
at the office of Deep Rock. Sometimes for a good reason, those gates can be removed temporarily to allow someone, uh, a disabled person, for example, to get into the preserve. They, you, whoever asked the question should certainly inquire. Mm -hmm. Um, we have another question uh, from Diane. Are there any other sites other than the depot site that shows paleo Indian or early Indian activity on the, sh on the shores of the Chippewag? Um, I know the short answer to this is yes, but do you have any uh, additional information for Diane? Uh, no, but there are of course lots of sites all around Connecticut and that are still being pursued as is the site in uh, on the Chapag. Um, it's, um, it was occupied for thousands of years. Um, it's fairly large. So there's a huge amount of work required to excavate it. it that has to be done with painstakingly, carefully measuring, recording, documenting, photographing each little object or pebble you get out of the hole. And it takes a lot of time, a lot of people, and considerable resources to do. Um, I don't know of any other sites along the Chapag River that are being actively pursued. It is not a good idea for amateurs to go and look at an archaeological site because just being there disturbs the ground, picking up something without recording exactly where it was is a means that we have lost precious evidence. And this evidence is, is valuable. It has enabled us to determine that the Native Americans were on this river beginning 10,300 years ago, and that they were there for thousands of years. That's an extraordinary bit of evidence or understanding that comes from the archeological research. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Rebecca about the Holiday House. She's wondering if you could share more about the Holiday House uh, she says, was there really a bowling alley and staff to take care of guests? Uh, the answer to that is yes. And why was the house dismantled? Uh, she's wondering. Well, there were that, but there were Episcopalian nuns who were officiated. Uh, the pictures of the Holiday House, the indoor of the Holiday House, you can find in the museum's exhibit. It was quite a substantial operation. It um, welcomed the three or four hundred young working women from the city every summer. Um, I don't know about the bowling alley, um, but um, it's quite an extraordinary bit of philanthropy that the founder initiated in the memory of his daughter and pursued himself as long as he lived. Um, it's a, it's, um, and the, I, I believe it was well financed during its existence. I assume that the founder uh, paid substantially for the Roebling suspension bridge across the Chapag River and arranged for the special railroad station to stop at the site of the bridge, just opposite the, the, the Holiday House. It's a long story. And um, I want to put a plug in if anyone is interested. I am uh, scheduled to lead a uh, history hike for Steep Rock. Um, on uh, a Sunday coming up in September. Uh, it looks like it's Sunday, September 20th at one o'clock uh, to the Holiday House. So uh, if you'd like to learn more about that, um, please contact Steep Rock to sign up for that hike. Um, with that, 
we've approached our one hour mark. Uh, if there are any final questions uh, from anyone out there in the audience, feel free to, to type them in. Oh, I see, where was Holiday House located? Um, you wanna uh, respond to that, Ed? Exactly where was Holiday House located? Well, it's down the river from the depot, a couple miles on the eastern bank of the river, or it's not on the bank, it's on the hills above the river on the eastern side of the river. And um, since it was uh, taken down in 1923, uh, it's overgrown. It's a site in the woods today, um, mainly. So it's hard to see much of the what it was, except with our imagination, which Stephen, with Stephen's help um, and your imagination, um, you can imagine what it was like. It was a, it was a beautiful idea for this man, honoring his daughter he'd lost. Um, and there are lots of stories about it that I think Stephen should would share with you and that I think are very interesting. Indeed, endearing. Thank you. And maybe we have one question that might lead us into uh, a segue into uh, your next lecture with us. Uh, David asks, what are issues facing the Chippewag in the future? Well, um, I think you can imagine what they might be. We've touched on some already. The pollution of the river from the Bantam and the Litchfield sewage disposal plant. The pollution of the river with pesticides or herbicides. Um, the, the water berry, the, the quantity of water for the river, which is of course essential to have a river, um, has been settled forever at least insofar as we were able to, by the agreement with Waterbury, um, which provides for flows to the river. And I will explain those in the next lecture. Um, there are uh, far in the future risks that I can imagine. Um, should the population of Northwest Connecticut substantially increase should Waterbury multiply its industrial base, should a lot can happen in the future. We as human beings are very good at inventing problems. So um, it's hard to predict, but um, the ones I've just mentioned seem to be the present concerns for the river well-being. We have, we, have, um, we have time for more questions, if you do, Stephen, but it's up to you. Um, if there are any final questions out there for Edwin, feel free to uh, type them into uh, the chat box um, down below. And um, uh, I don't see any more coming in, so I think I would like to thank you very much, Edwin, for sharing the amazing history of the Schwag River with us this evening. And I'd like to remind everyone that um, part two, the story of a river, rallies to save the Schwag will take place on Monday, August 3rd at 6.30. Please uh, register for your link to that Zoom presentation on the museum's website at gunmuseum.org. And um, thank you everyone for joining us and please uh, stay safe and be well. Thank you all.